way too early for this. <clears throat> Good morning, literally. It's 8.23. Welcome to episode two of Feetson. Uh, we're gonna look at some roundabouts, some good roundabouts, some bad roundabouts, maybe observe some land use and just some other general infrastructure observations. And this is a single lane roundabout, which we need more of and less of that. Fragile man. And also, I want to start off this episode with a big thank you to Not Just Bikes because he promoted episode one of Feetson and it really took off. And I just want to say thank you to Jason for that. And thank you to everybody who are the typical Not Just Bike, uh, Not Just Bikes viewers who came over and said hello on the YouTube page. Some of you joined me over on Twitter and uh, you've all been wonderful. And I really appreciate you coming along and checking out the videos and saying hi and participating. So thanks. Okay, so we're going to look at some infrastructure. We're going to answer some questions from Twitter and we have a lot of them and I want to get going on them right now. Question one before we get riding and looking around by Sean Tuff. If you could get the people of your town to understand one concept related to feats or life, what would it be? That's a wonderful question, Sean. Wow. I don't know. It's, it's hard to convey to these people who generally drive uh, either because they have to or they want to. Um, they think, you know, riding a bike is for children or recreation. It's hard to convey to them how much joy it has brought me to switch over to doing things in life by bike, especially on electric cargo bikes. They're a super enabler. Living the feature life is enjoyable if you have the infrastructure, first of all, but the, an enabling bike is key in my uh, opinion. So getting groceries, going to the restaurant, and doing all that by bike rather than driving your big stupid clunky car that costs a lot of money and the feature life is just so much better, but you need the infrastructure and a bike that you enjoy and that enables you. That's my answer. Let's ride. We've been standing around too long. Before we get going, let me flip the camera around. So you can see this raised crossing, which, you know, it's all right. I'd have it a little bit steeper, but it works. Now this is a single lane roundabout, which is rare in Carmel. They, the engineers here sure are in love with their double lane roundabouts to prioritize a level of service for cars. It's also pretty quiet right now. People haven't totally hit the road for work yet, but they should be soon. Let's ride. I think I'll point the camera forward so you can see the chaos in construction rather than me for the moment. So this multi-use path is very nice, definitely enabling. Um, this used to just be a sidewalk, so this is much better, although I do hate how the car entrances and exits take the top layer here. And look at this KFC, this blind entrance and exit for the drive-through. People are gonna get hit there. So this will be nice to have this road diet. This new multi-use path is useful. It's uh, on par for decent North American infrastructure. But now we're coming upon Carmel's infamous double lane roundabouts. This one is particularly dangerous, although it's fairly quiet right now. But let's cross it. stop here to talk about it. So Carmel loves to build double lane roundabouts. Uh, their engineers are just enamored with them, but I think most of their engineers drive at minimum a mid-sized SUV to work rather than ride a bike or anything else. Now don't get me wrong, I'm sure somebody has a one wheel or a scooter, but if you regularly rode to work and were an engineer for the city on a bike, you wouldn't be putting double lane roundabouts all over the place, especially in the central core. Now we need to answer another question while we watch this roundabout. Ben, how much does security for your bikes, such as safe places to lock them, risk of theft, factor into where and when you use them? Or what can cities and towns do to make it easier for people to cycle from locking security perspective. What does Carmel do well? I'm pretty lucky here in Carmel. It's a really safe community. Theft here is very, very, very low. But you can always employ different locks. With our cargo bikes, I have three options. I have the ca cafe lock on the wheel. I have an Avis 1060 chain lock, a regular U-lock, D-lock, whatever, which I've 
never used, but just employ different uh, chains, uh, whatever you're chaining up to, depending upon where you're at, assess the risk, uh, lock appropriately. There's really nothing else you can do. Any bike can be stolen with enough time, any lock can be cut, but it's just about making it more difficult for somebody to take your bike rather than somebody else's or not at all. So I hope that answers your question. Look at this roundabout, it's chaotic. I don't like it, it's unsafe. My wife won't cycle here. I couldn't see children cycling here. I don't like cycling here. And this is pretty central to Carmel's core. See, the guy in the pickup truck was more interested in me than actually navigating his pickup truck through the roundabout. So these should be single lane. Um, I don't remember the numbers exactly. I'm pretty sure single lane can move 56,000 cars per day. I'm probably wrong and somebody uh, very competent and smart will correct me in the comments. And I believe that going up to double lane roundabouts, that only increases it by 10 or 12,000 cars per day. Point being is you don't need to be moving that many cars anyway within the central core of your city, so double lane roundabouts have no place here. It should be a city for people, not cars. Okay, e-bike advocate. You have a presence in Carmel and must be recognized by the mayor, town council, etc. Have they ever taken the time to, to consult with you on what could be done to make a pretty good system even better? Yeah, I have met with the mayor not too long after moving here. Talked to a few people in the city. In the end, I'm not part of Carmel, I am not Carmel. I haven't been here long enough, never will be. And my overall impression is they don't really care what I think or what I have to say. They're gonna do what they wanna do. And as far as I'm concerned, that's making a town for cars, cosplays as a town for people. Maybe not an opinion they wanna hear, but that's what it is. And I use the infrastructure every day. Okay, let's stop here really quick. Didn't ride very far. Not doing much riding today. <laughs> so I wanna stop here because this is the only place I've ever been hit by a car, right here. I was going this direction. A car was coming out of the gas station and because it's a road diet, the motorist was only looking that way. He was not looking back this way at me. So I stopped here, but you see how wide the radii is on this entrance and exit? Or he had his car turned really wide to come out and was only looking that direction. I knew he didn't see me and I was trying to yell to get his attention. He couldn't hear me either and then he just took off his car drove right into the front of my bike grabbed my bike and somehow during that broke one of my toes this is bad design proper design would have not the wide turning radii here it would be much tighter so that motors had to come out slowly assess the path on both sides um, and just be much more careful but again this is just your typical uh, American infrastructure design that just wants to move cars in and out easily as possible without holding drivers accountable for needing to take it slow and be observant as to what's going on. Thanks, Carmel. The only place I've ever been hit by a car. Keep it up. All right, Melody. I'm not clear when you're biking in the U.S. and when you're biking in the Netherlands, but when you come across it, can you explain to us the difference in engineering between how U.S. traffic circles work and the protected ones in the Netherlands? I find these genius. Thank you. Good question, Melody. Showing you the difference between roundabouts in the Netherlands and in the U.S. is going to be almost impossible for me to do right here. There's just so many small design features that make Dutch roundabouts safer, not only for motorists, but for people riding bikes and on foot and scooter and wheelchair uh, that we don't do here. Here in the U.S., roundabouts are designed... Mother here, roundabouts are designed to make it safer primarily for motorists, but the pedestrian bike thing is more of an afterthought. Low speed collisions for motorists, but bikes and pedestrians just have to find themselves here in these refuges trying not to get hit. Anyway, I don't think I can answer that adequately. Please refer to Bicycle Dutch, Dutch Cycling Embassy, or Mobicon who can give some really nice uh, diagrams that show the difference between our roundabout designs. Can you see the roundabout? So yet another double lane roundabout for Carmel, which should be single lane. This isn't gonna make anybody happy with me, but I don't care. I don't have any respect for these Carmel engineers who keep making these double lane roundabouts. Just prioritize people and people on bikes for once in your life, rather than level of service for cars. The traffic engineering aspect of, of double lane roundabouts and just moving cars is just ridiculous. It's worn out and it's over with. Uh, we do do a lot of roundabout art here in Carmel. So we have this one here, which looks a little bit like 
what we're all thinking it looks like. Or if you want to go a different route, it looks like the spike protein of COVID-19. Not my favorite piece of roundabout art. We do have a lot of others that look much better. <laughs> but let's talk about um, land use. What you see over here is a new apartment building and actually mixed use development. So on the bottom is restaurants and stuff. And then we've got apartments up top. Over here on the other side of the sign over there is a grocery store. Over here uh, was a former strip mall looking place, which is just a real waste of, of space. It looked horrible. Uh, they just tore it down and they're gonna be building apartments here with some commercial space on the floor or on the first floor. So it will be mixed use development, trying to make things a little bit more dense here in Carmel. And I appreciate that. So let's keep that up. Okay. What percent of your rides errands necessitate a cargo versus regular bike? Do you think that's different for you in North America uh, rather than folks in Europe? I guess I'm curious whether the cargo is filling a gap both in need and advocacy in the US. Uh, all of our bikes are cargo bikes. I have no use nor desire to ride a quote unquote regular bike because I use bikes as a car replacement. So I need to be accomplishing something, doing something, likely carrying or moving something. All of our bikes are cargo bikes. All of our bikes are electric cargo bikes. I very much think that uh, their design is the game changer for the US. We're trying to replace car trips on hostile sprawl infrastructure. So we need these highly utilitarian bikes to get that done. So yes, 100% of everything we do is by cargo bike. So now we're gonna take a planter protected bike lane uh, on the road diet street. Obviously a final product of you know green separation and grade separated uh, bike lane would be great, but I'm pretty happy with this. Let's take a look at these planters. They keep them watered, beautiful. They even put something in them for the winter. <laughs> there was some controversy about them. Each of these planters supposedly cost about $3,000 and a bunch of angry motorists were unhappy that some money went away from them and two people on bike. But at $3,000 per planter, I think that's a bargain to protect life uh, as good as planters can do and beautify the city. I mean, I think this is beautiful, honestly, especially with the landscaping that Carmel does. Carmel, wonderful job on that and a wonderful job on the maintenance of them. You guys are awesome when it comes to that. But back on the cost thing, People in Carmel got mad that each of these planters was $3,000, yet I was telling you about the new development where they're building uh, the apartments and some mixed use development. And I come to find out that there will be a parking garage because Carmel loves parking garages. Uh, each of those spaces, each parking space in the parking garage is $30,000, according to the developer, $30,000. But $3,000 for these is absurd. And yes, I know, developer money, uh, investment money, public money, whatever. Still, come on, calm down. So yes, this planter protected bike lane is wonderful. My wife rides it and feels safe here. And when I ride it, I feel good. I feel happy. The flowers are pretty. Okay. Next question. What do you think about the future of North America's bike infrastructure? Do you think it will be completely common at one point or maybe some places are way better than others? And if so, when do you think that will be? Uh, it's not gonna make a lot of people happy, but I think North America is going to be glacially slow for lack of a better term on getting proper infrastructure that is shifted away from the car. Even if I live to be a hundred, I don't think that I'm going to see the day where it even resembles the simplest form of a livable infrastructure that we could achieve, which would be Copenhagen. I don't even think that we'll see that. I think that the auto industry and the car infrastructure advocates are just going to push back hard, hard, hard. And it's, I just don't see it changing here. And I don't think it's going to be normal. I think it, there's going to be pockets of little cities or towns that make some nice, nice things, kind of like what I'm experiencing here. I just don't think it's going to happen here. I, I don't have any hope for the United States when it comes to anything really. <laughs> Uh, especially that, especially infrastructure. Look at this. Road diets when done right, you got some uh, flowers, you got trees, you got some green. It looks so good. I really like it. Sometimes I extend my ride so I can ride next to this. Okay, so now we're coming up on another double lane roundabout. I'm gonna face the camera forward.
it's chaotic. Should not be this way. Here we are yet again at a double lane roundabout in Carmel. It should be a single lane roundabout, but the Carmel engineers want to prioritize moving cars through Carmel, really putting the car in Carmel. Up behind me is a monstrosity that some of you may have seen uh, on the internet before. This building here, which I don't find to be particularly beautiful, and as far as I know, the top floor is inhabited by somebody who has a photo of Donald Trump in their bathroom above their toilet, not as a sign of disrespect, but because they love the man so much, which I'd believe that in this town, I guess. What is more important to you if only one can be built? One, protected lanes. Two, protected junctions. Well, that's gonna be projected. That's going to be protected junctions. Protected junctions, protected intersections are gonna be more important than protected lanes because that's where you stand to have your most conflict and potential for uh, somebody getting hurt, hit, killed, injured. Uh, you gotta protect your intersections, uh, again, because they have the most conflict points. Now, we'll get on the bike. We've looked at this horrible double lane roundabout enough and we'll go down to a single lane roundabout, which is right over there. And yes, I keep going from roundabout to roundabout. This whole city is full of roundabouts. I think it's 145 roundabouts, more roundabouts than any city in the whole United States. Natalia, how do you maintain your passion and not let it fizzle out? What inspires and discourages you the most? Natalia, those are wonderful questions and things that I think about on a daily basis. So what inspires me and what keeps me going is I have to consume media, uh, largely from the Netherlands, but Europe as a whole helps to keep me inspired and keep me reminded of what livable cities are like, what proper infrastructure design looks like, and seeing all the people on bikes and all the people on the trains and the, the trams and walking. I have to see those people. I have to see that reality happening to keep my energy alive, to keep doing this. As far as what discourages me, what discourages me the most is uh, actually uh, being exposed to North America Twitter. <laughs> when I consume too much North America Twitter and bike advocacy, I get down, I get negative, I get angry, just because it's such a, such a bad space. It's, it's rarely good news, right? Uh, so that's what gets me down the most. So I have to try to distance myself uh, from these things. Let's bike through this roundabout. We didn't need to do that, I just wanted to. So it's a single lane roundabout and I love it. Every time we have a single lane roundabout, I'm always very happy because that's how they should be. They're, they're much more calm. Boy, this episode is not nearly as tranquil or quiet as episode one, especially because everywhere we go, we have car stuff. So like a car place, a gas station, it's poor land use in the core of a city. Another single lane roundabout. And you might notice this ugly strip mall looking area back behind uh, that's closing. It's all getting torn down and it will be built into a dense development uh, with, with housing, with commercial space. Um, that's all gonna be happening soon. Jesus, I hate cars. And yeah, you know what? Let's answer that question. Philip, do you commute to work by bike? If so, what issues do you encounter regarding inclement weather, having necessary items, attire, considerations, etc.? I don't think work is the important aspect of that question. Uh, I just think it is what happens whenever it's not sunny. So you can plan for rain. We have radar technology, uh, but also there's things like uh, Clever Hood. If you look that up, they make an excellent rain cape that can keep you mostly dry and enable you to uh, go places in the rain. I know that ever since I bought mine, rain hasn't turned me off to riding my bike and going somewhere under threat of rain or if it's actively raining it does a good enough job of taking care of me as far as cold weather and snow i learned how to ride a bike in winter up in minnesota and it's not about being all puffy it's about the proper layers 
so you can still be thin layered uh, and stay warm. Riding in various weather types is not as hard as you'd think. It just takes some practice and some repetition and eventually you get used to it. So here's where Carmel has a lot of work to do. We still have these little sidewalks, right? They still have a lot of places where they just left the sidewalk and said, oh, that's good enough. And you'll notice how whenever I'm going across these crossings, I'm having to turn way back to look. That's again due to bad design. So you look how sharp the corners are to turn and cross. So that, that kind of touches on the whole Dutch roundabout design, uh, US roundabout design. It's very, can be very awkward to try to ride a bike across these things. So that's all I have for this episode. We just rode around, looked at some roundabouts. Please take the third exit on the roundabound. It's roundabout. Correct. <sighs> roundabound. You're saying roundabound. It's roundabout. I tried to answer some questions the best I could. I get, I get really distracted, so you'll have to, you guys will have to forgive me. It's hard to be surrounded by moving traffic and noises and, and try to adequately <clears throat> think about, pay attention to answering these questions the best I can. Pretty scatterbrained out here trying to do it. Okay, everybody. Thanks for coming by. Thanks for watching. I hope this episode was enjoyable as well. And I will be making a future one probably in the next uh, few weeks to a month. Please come follow me on Twitter at American Pizza. I'll put up the call for comments and questions well ahead of time so that you can submit any questions you have or any requests for me to address in episode three of Feetson. Thanks to all the new Not Just Bikes viewers who came over. I appreciate you all and I'm glad to have you along. And thanks to everybody who's been interacting with me on Twitter and my YouTube this whole time anyway. I appreciate your time.